What is faith? Hello, friends. Welcome to the YouTube channel. You here with Pastor James Devalon. Listen, I got on my screen today, Pastor Randy Skeet. We are still talking about biblical definition. Hopefully, these messages will encourage your faith. Hopefully, these messages will strengthen you along your journey. And the question now is, what is faith? I'm going to let him speak. It's about a 14 minutes video. I'm not going to say anything throughout the whole discussion. At the end of this discussion, I'm going to share some things with you that I want to share in the light of what he's speaking about, just to, you know, to embellish the message a little bit more. But this is a powerful message, by the way. So you're going to get some content from Indy's kid, a little bit from me as well, in the hope we can uh, we can find the strength to make it to these, to these last times. Because let me tell you something. Last time we spoke about grace, today we're speaking about faith. And we need faith in that Christian journey today. So let me be quiet. Let's get to the video. Make sure you like and subscribe to the page. Click the bell icon for more. Are you ready for this? Let's dial in. What is faith? In Hebrews 11, verse 6, the Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith it is impossible to please God. Then we must understand what is faith. What does it mean to exercise faith in God? We can begin at no better place than Genesis chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Everything that exists, God created. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Stop. And God said, we are introduced to God's word. The word said, let there be light. The Bible says there was light. This is our introduction to the word of God. And in that brief statement, we learn, if we read honestly, that the word of God does exactly what it says. Let there be light. There was light. The entire chapter of Genesis 1 uses this formula, and God said, and God said, and God said. We are introduced, my listening friend, in Genesis 1, not so much to what was made on what day, but we're introduced to the fact that God's word is the agent or was the agent of creation. God's word was the agent of life. God's word was not only the agent of creation, God's word is the agent of maintaining that creation. We learn this about God's word in Genesis 1. Now the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. So it is not by accident that Genesis 1 records not simply creation, but how creation came about. It came about by the word of God. Psalm 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. What are the hosts of them? The heavenly bodies and also intelligent beings that inhabit heaven. They were made by the word of God. Now, we're told we must have faith in order to please God. What is faith? Let the Bible tell us what is faith. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. We'll read from verse 5. Matthew 8, reading from verse 5. We're trying to answer the question, what is faith? And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion saith unto him, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having servants under me. And I say to this man, Go and he goeth, to another come and he cometh, and to my servant do this and he doeth it. Verse 10 of Matthew 8 tells us, And when Jesus heard that, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. What did Jesus mean? I have not found so great faith. Now, Jesus was surrounded by Jews 
that did not believe he was the Messiah, despite the fact that the Old Testament points clearly to Christ as the Messiah. They did not believe the word. This non-Jew, this centurion, he believed in the word of God. And so he told Jesus, it's not necessary for you to come speak the word. Jesus called that faith. Then what is faith? Faith is taking God at his word. It is as simple as that. And if anyone complicates it, that person is taking you in the wrong direction. The Bible truths are simple. Faith is simply taking God at his word. And why should I take God at his word? Because the entire universe was made by the word of God. Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light. There was light. Now, can you trust that word? The answer has to be yes. And it's the same word that made the light made the trees. They are a living thing. The same word that made the trees made the fish and the birds a living thing. The same word that made the fish and the birds made the land animals. The same word gave life to Adam and Eve, human beings. It is all by the word of God. Let me pause as I introduce this thought into your mind. Anything God does for you and for me, he does it through his word. The same way the universe was made by the word of God. When God forgives, he forgives by his word. That's why Jesus told the woman taken in adultery, thy sins are forgiven thee. When Jesus deals with demons, he uses his word. Matthew 8, 16, and when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirit with his word. It is all done by the word of God. When Jesus raised Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come forth. When Jesus raised the son of the widow of Nain, Luke 7, verse 14, he said, Young man, I say unto thee, arise. When he raised the daughter of the, 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 the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, he said, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. It is all by the word of God. And we're called to trust this word. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When Christ comes a second time, he does not touch the earth, but he raises all the righteous dead buried in the earth. How does he do that? With his word. Now, faith is believing that word. How can you not believe a word that raises the dead? How can you not believe a word that created the universe? How can we not believe a word that made all the land animals, all the fish, all the birds, all the vegetation? How can we not believe a word that raised the dead man, Lazarus, from the grave? Faith is taking God at his word. My listening friend, if I sound earnest, I am earnest because it is so simple. And yet we try to complicate this thing called faith. Faith is taking God at his word. You cannot separate the word of God from faith. Remove the word, there's no reason for faith. There is no faith. The Bible says in Romans 1, verse 16, verse 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? The righteous shall live by faith. Who are the righteous? Who are the just? Those that are made right with God. And how are they made right with God? By a declaration from God that that person is right. And by the ongoing power of God in that person's life to preserve that right status with God, which we call sanctification. It is all done by the word. Let me say it again. What God offers you and offers me for an example. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the word. Now believe that word when you say, Father, I am sorry for stealing or lying or whatever your eye may have done. When you say, I'm sorry, forgive me, you believe the word that says God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. 
He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. The Bible says when we distrust God, when we do not exercise faith in God, we are virtually calling God a liar. Lack of faith, a refusal to take God at his word, is tantamount, is equal to calling God a liar. First John chapter 5, verse 10. And so the Bible calls upon us, take God at his word. In Psalm 119, verse 133, the Bible says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Listen to those words carefully as we discuss faith. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. The Bible says it is not uh, inevitable that any sin should dominate your life or mine. Let not any iniquity have dominion. Let me not be ruled by any addiction. If I order my steps in the word of God, the word of God gives us assurance that we can be delivered from any addiction, any domineering sin in the life. But we must believe the word of God and we must receive that word within. How do I receive that word within? I surrender body, soul, mind, might, strength, understanding, everything of me I surrender to thus saith the Lord. This is living by faith. Powerful, powerful. We're going to stop right here. This is great. So I got myself a whole bunch of verses already looking at the content of the word. And to keep it simple, faith is taking God at his word. And there's a whole bunch of verses here. He is uh, sharing from his head. Uh, I love me Randy Skit, man. I love me Randy Skit. Um, and I did hear some of you in the comment who made the comment that I don't know why he recommended, uh, you know, the Fauci ouchie. Um, I'll tell you what, I think a lot of Seventh Adventist ministers did this and they were wrong. They were wrong. We can hold them accountable for that. I don't think we should condemn them. I don't think we should discard them. Uh, but we should definitely call them out and said, yeah, you did wrong here. And I, I do agree. Some of them, um, I, I would say all of them should offer an apology, but somebody has to tell them that though, some of them, right? Does that necessarily mean we should discard the nature of their message now? Shouldn't we believe that these men could be used by God? We have to keep in mind no matter who they are and how great they are and how well they can share amazing things with us, they're still human beings with flaws and mistakes. And history has also shown that Seventh-day Adventists don't do well in a time of crisis. That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> I mean, just, just so you know, every time a drastic situation is happening in various parts of the world, the Adventist church oftentimes do make similar mistake of that of the world. That's, that's also a fact. So what do we do? Do we just jump ship? No, we have to plant our feet, goes back to the message on the promises of God's word. Even when it comes to places where if there has to be some opposition, so let it be. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we should just jump ship. I just think we cannot always trust. Um, unfortunately, you cannot always trust leadership, okay? They're going to fail you. That's what the Bible says. Put not your trust in princes, nor in a son of men, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to the earth in that very day. His thoughts perish. We're supposed to trust in God. Even in God-fearing men that we love, we admire, keep in mind, they will fail you. I will fail you. You will fail me. We, but Jesus doesn't fail us. So this is why we have to be gracious toward even men like uh, Randy Skeet. But again, going back to the nature of what he's sharing right now, this is the word of God. He's speaking the truth. So let's take the word of God for what it is, regardless of the vessel. Okay. So now let's move on. I thought this was amazing. Great verses he shared here. Hebrews 11 was shared. Genesis 1 was shared. Psalms 33, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. I got a whole lot here. Um, I want to share with you now in my little segment to add into the word. How do you increase your faith? Right? We are told in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God that one of the things that we need is something called the shield of faith. So in the armor of God, there's a lot going on here. We are told that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I have an entire series on the armor of God. 
If that's something you want to go through, we can go through these messages about 30 minutes long. Maybe when I'm done with the Mark of the Beast, we can do an Armor of God and, and stuff like that. So I have a number of series of studies and PowerPoints and stuff like that that we could share. But this one will, will, will encourage you in that journey. So it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against in the evil days and having done all to stand. So now I want you to notice that one of the things that God tells us to, uh, that we need to take on. It is something called the shield of faith. Shield of faith. Why do we need such a thing? Let's go to my PowerPoint. So we already know what faith is, right? So I'm going to talk about the three sizes of faith mentioned in Scripture. Yes, there are sizes to faith. Uh, the first size we have in the Bible is this one here in the story of the men, uh, the disciples sleeping in the boat. And Jesus says this about their faith. And he says unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So some people have no faith, size number one. Size number two deals with Peter. Peter had little faith, according to Jesus. Matthew 14, verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hands and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Whereof, wherefore this doubt, that some doubt. So some people have little faith, some people have no faith, but there's another segment of faith, and this is the one Wendy Skeet made reference to, uh, talking about the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus says, When he heard it, and he, he marveled and said unto him, uh, that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no doubt, in Israel. Interesting enough, that man was not even a Jew. He was a Gentile. In the Bible, it seems that the unbelieving world, the people that are not of the church, have more faith than the people of God. Don't get me started. Let's move on. So we have no faith, little faith, great faith. So these are the three categories of faith, if you want to call it like that, or the three sizes of faith we find in the Bible. Some people in this world have no faith in God, no matter what you tell them. Some people have little faith little faith. So they don't go far, but they have enough to believe, right? Some people have great faith. We want to be among those who have great faith. So now let me share a few things with you. Um, Alan T. Jones put it this way, faith is expecting the word of God to do what it says and depending upon that word only to do what it says. Mm. You work with that. Now, what has God given to every man? Every man has been given what the Bible refers to a measure of faith. We are told to take on the shield of faith. If we can take on the shield of faith, that means God must have given us a measure of faith to work with. In Romans 12, verse 3, For I say unto you, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man, the measure of faith. So faith has been measured by God and given to every man. Powerful. So now every single person has a degree of faith. Mussolini had faith. Stalin, Stalin and Hitler had faith. You name these men, all have had faith. faith. Ted Bundy. You know who these men were? Albert Fish. Mm. John Wayne Gacy. Jeffrey Dahmer. All of them had faith. So what they chose to do and the decisions they made, however they chose to exercise that faith, it was up to them. But God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. What about these people? You know who they are? Hmm? Charles Darwin, Madame Flavesky, right? Voltaire. What about the B666? What about Nelson? I mean, we're talking about people who plays in the kingdom of darkness. Every one of them had been given a measure of faith. So guess what? God is not to be blamed for what people chooses to do with the faith that has been given them. But the truth of the matter is, you have been given a measure of faith. It is up to you what you do with that, how you grow that faith, how you exercise that faith, how you strengthen that faith. It is left up to you and I to do something with it. So God has given to every man a measure of faith. So we need the shield of faith that we may be able to withstand all the attacks of the enemy 
in this warfare. Now, watch this. God has given to every man a measure of faith. Now, it is left to each of us to exercise that faith. Faith is like a muscle which needs to be exercised continuously or else it will become weak and die. Faith gets weaker. Faith gets stronger depending on what we do, what we do with it. Now, let me ask these questions. What are seven ways to increase your faith? We're going to keep this one simple. I'm not going to go through every single verse. I'm just going to put the, the, the different elements in the screen. So if you want your faith to be strong, here are seven ways that you can increase your faith. These are the things that I'm doing myself. I'm learning to do these things more and more each and every day. But these are seven things you can do right now for your faith to be strong. Are you ready? Number one, seven ways to increase your faith. Number one, contemplate the works of God in nature. This is in Matthew 6 and also in Psalms 19. God's in nature, God's works in nature is there is something beautiful about the creative work of God in nature. Take time to, to walk among the lilies of the valley, the beauty of nature. Go out to the park, find one of those places in your neighborhood and, and walk and enjoy the atmosphere of nature. There is something about that that will teach you lessons that will help you to realize that God is a God of love. Look how these things are happening in nature, the beauty and the leaves and the trees and the fruit trees. There's a reason why Jesus uses nature mainly to speak to his parables. Now, of course, you can say many of them were farmers. So Jesus met them where they are, intellectually speaking as well. However, one of the best ways to understand the kingdom of God, the works of God, the duties and responsibilities of God and what God cares about you, look what he does in nature. So study the works of God in nature. Secondly, listen to the testimonies of other Christians. You want your faith to grow? The Bible says in Psalm 107 verse 2, that let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So guess what? People who speak about their testimony, you need to listen to them. This is why we have testimonial segments in this um, channel. We share some of that as well. Even in church, uh, our pastor, Pastor Scott, he has segments where people will come up and share something that's going on in their lives. Sometime it's Sabbath morning. It will encourage the entire body. So speak about what the Lord has done for you. Listen to what the Lord is doing in somebody else's life. Take a minute to listen to these testimonies because they will strengthen your faith. They will strengthen your faith. Next, revisit your past experiences with God. You know, sometime in that journey, you forget where the Lord has saved you from. And sometime in that journey, we can sometime come to a point as if we start complaining, right? We start saying, maybe God isn't good enough to me because of what's going on with me. What you need to do is to look, take a look backward. Remember what the Lord has done for us in the past. We are told in Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, Lest thou forget what thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thine eyes all the days of thy life. But you need to teach them to your children, to your sons and your sons' sons. And the idea is that consistently speak about what the Lord has done for you. Remember what he saved you from. Remember who you used to be. When you actually think about your own past experiences in the light of God's saving grace and his responsibility in bringing about changes in your life, your faith will be strengthened. Next, listen to the preaching of the word of God. This is why we go to church. We are told in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith, so then faith cometh by hearing and a hearing by the word of God. So the word of God must be heard. Why do you go to church on Sabbath? Why do you sit in the church on Sunday morning? It's because once the word of God is preached, faith increases, especially when the preacher man is doing a good work, sharing the word of God. So you need to listen to God's word as well. And not only that, study the word of God for yourself in your home. Next, exercise faith, okay, by doing what God says. So you want your faith to grow, put it to use. You want your faith to grow, do what he says. You want your faith to grow, apply the faith. So once you apply it, you use it, friends, it gets bigger. So the more you use it, the stronger it gets. Next, uh, number six, endorse the trials and persecution in your life. Ah, this is one we don't like very much, but guess what? We need to understand trials and persecutions have been sent to us to strengthen us 
in our journey of faith. First Peter 1 verse 9 says that the trials of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be, fine, or maybe, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. So trials has been sent to you and I so that our faith in Jesus can be increased. We may not like these trials, but we need to endure. We may not like the way it feels, but we need to endure because it is through these trials and persecutions and hardships in your life, your faith in Jesus will remain strong. Last but not least, ask God to increase your faith. This looks like a simple one, James. Couldn't you just say that? Yeah, Luke 17, 17, Mark 9, 24, the Bible says, Lord, increase my faith. So if your faith is weak today, I think it's Luke 17, Verse five, I'm not mistaken. I think one of the, the, the first reference might be wrong. But anyway, I'll put that on the screen when I do the edit. Here's the thing. Ask God to increase your faith. You can simply ask. Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you will find and knock and it shall be open unto you. To everyone who ask, if receive, if to him that seek, if find, if and to him that knock, if it shall be open. So these are some of the ways you can increase your faith in Jesus. And I want you to take a picture of this, read it from your Bible, apply it in your life. So hopefully this was a blessing. I will say once again, Pastor Randy Skeet is definitely a blessing from the Lord. Uh, these are men we need to pray for, love and appreciate. And sometimes there are things we don't have to like that they do but we shouldn't discard their message i think some of them are more of a blessing than they are not <laughs> some of them do make mistakes but by all means i would rather be given grace and mercy for my flaws and my mistakes my wrong counsels especially in a time of fear and confusion i would rather be given grace than to be condemned let's just put it that way here is the thing Share your thought and perspective with me. Has this been a blessing for you? How are you going to apply this in your life today? Share your thought with me and put your comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe to the page. If you happen to be new, click the bell icon for more. Let me know what you think about this reaction video. Link in the description below. We're building a whole new, uh, another segment here. So we're doing different series to encourage you in that journey. So let me know where you stand when it comes to that. I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one. Bye.